Nolan Bushnell said the true entrepreneur is a doer, not a dreamer. Today on the show, we are talking to a doer. Welcome to The Real Talk. It is such a pleasure to have you with us and this particular day is a special one. We are talking to Kevin Kajirimundu, who is the founder and CEO of Uzuri K. And why, Kevin, it is a pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really How is it going? I am, everything is going well, I would say. I recently awesome. lost my grandma, so it's not really oh, like... Oh, sorry but. about that. How long yeah. ago? A few weeks. No, it's actually like a week ago. A week ago. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. I lost mine in 2021, so I know how that yeah. feels. Yeah. Right. Sorry about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm humbled that it's within such a short time and you've been able to come to the show. Yeah. Thank you really for that. to do this. Yeah. You know, Kevin, you started off a small business, Uzuri K&Y, that has now really grown and gone global. I would love to hear that part of your life but before it it will be nice to know you a little bit talk to us about your upbringing oh great so um, first of all i really want to thank you for having me uh, in this show and i hope that i will be able to inspire one or two people um i was born and raised here in kigadi uh growing up um in a very in a rwanda that was a little bit different um rwanda that was building itself I mean, fighting whatever was happening. So I was born in the early 1990s, pretty much. And so being part of that generation, I was actually a little bit younger, confused of what was going on, and also um, thriving to be or listening to great leaders coming in the country and telling us to do better um, was challenging. It's really what really made me who I am today. And so going to high school, I studied sciences, of course, because everyone was like, we need engineers, we need tanks. The country needs scientists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I also followed that. I, th I feel like if you were good at one, you know, science, or math or physics or whatever, they would just be pushing you to do sciences. And so I did sciences like just automatically like that. And um, up and above, I just remembered there are so many other things that I haven't touched. My father was a very creative person. Um, he was actually, before he was killed, he was actually building a school that would teach people or his people to be able to um, learn new skills or technical skills like sewing um, and, oh. and more so that would help them to actually earn a living. And so, and also I grew up looking at my brothers. My brothers are very creative, they're painters. My, one of my, brother, my older brother is a, is a really wonderful painter. My younger brother is also a wonderful painter. And so I started listening to, to my inner voices of what I really wanted and what I really, really was passionate about. And so I went to KIST. And my, my other <laughs> brother was also there. And my brother was like, you know what? You're a creative person. Why don't you change your major? I was going to KIST to study um, engineering. engineering. And so my brother, why don't you change? And I was like, you know what? Now that I think about it, and then he brought me a brochure of creative designs and environmental building. I was like, oh, wow, I didn't even know that it existed. So I went to, re to the registrar. I changed my major, but it took me like two weeks. I, would, I was always crying because she was like, how can you change this? Every student actually is looking for this major yeah. and you are changing to creative what? Please, I'm going to change for you, but don't come back here crying. I was like, I swear I'll uh -oh. never come back. I and that made you cry again. for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Honest, I was crying in her office. I, was sitting, oh. I never attended uh, classes for like two weeks. Oh. I didn't. So she changed and I was like, I'll never come back. I haven't seen her since then. Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's happy <laughs> that she didn't see that nagging, crying baby. And yeah. so I, there I actually was so lucky. I met my co-founder, Isolde, who was already at, in the class. And yeah. so instead of just having conversations about the future, about who we were, personally I went to a girls' school in high school. And so I thought, oh, wow, where are the women? Because there were way more men than women in school. And so coming from the background of a girls' school, you, you're thinking, what happened? So I started really getting interested in... Um, education system and how actually, you, you, when you actually look mm -hmm. at the numbers, how numbers drop from uh, primary school, basic you know, school, and then up to all level and to university, the numbers keep dropping. You have mm -hmm. so many little girls in, in primary schools, and then you have way less numbers, like around 40% when you go up. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking, oh, wow, so I'm one of the privileged ones, really, to be honest. And so we started having conversations that really led to creating Missouri, which, which really was the purpose to create a company that would become a source of income for 
other young women and, and also men like ourselves. Amazing. And so the conversation to start Uzuri Ken Y started at KIST. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, take us to that yeah, uh, story. <laughs> I think <laughs> How did it move from you and your co-founder just having a conversation about it to actualizing it? Yeah, um, I mean, my co-founder and I, both of us ha had our own convictions on the side that were super interesting. Because when we started having, people would actually be like, you don't run out of things to talk about. We didn't. <laughs> we were always um, looking at... And also our major was mm. mocked for being so superficial because we're learning creative designs, we're learning environmental build, we're, we're learning media design, graphic design, communication. People really didn't see it as valuable. Oh. And everybody was wondering, like, these people, who, who is actually going to hire them? What are the companies that are out there that can hire these people? And so but the greatest lesson that we learned from there was that design is a problem, it's a problem solving process. So that only sentence actually made us who we are wow. um, to be able to to be innovative and so those conversations were really around that what can we create what are we passionate are we passionate about fashion but what is fashion today in mm -hmm. in the world where there's so many issues where climate change is a critical challenge to our own future yeah and so myself and is all were uh, appalled by how diverting our conversations were going in the same direction and so we started, we started thinking, this is the time to actually launch something. We had nothing, <laughs> to be honest. We were just students. You had nothing. You were young. You were students. Mm. Nothing, nothing. We would just take motorbikes, go to like, second-hand markets. I don't even think they're second-hand. They're like third-hand markets. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if that exists. What second are you looking for hand. there? Looking for old shoes, <laughs> torn down so that we can learn like what is the composition, mm -hmm. components within the shoe, and how can we find them? Oh you know? my goodness! Uh, and most of the shoes that were there, just like oh my god, they were built in like seventies <laughs> or something. So <laughs> the technology has changed completely. Yeah, if you if you're to make those shoes, nobody would wear them today. No, even the structure would not be practical. Yeah. So it was really hard to actually be able to come up with like the, what is how do you make a shoe? For us, it was like someone who's learning to make a car, like, it was just so hard, it was like, how do we do it? So then yeah. we started, you know, learning, um, and later on, we, we used to actually go to a cobbler, and um, my co-founder used to go to a cobbler to change, to kind of repair her shoes, mm -hmm. and she always was amazed by, by the skills of the cobbler. It's an old man called Francois, and we're like, you know what, he does it really well, why don't we ask him to build a shoe together? And he was like, no, we can't. And mm. he, has, he had worked actually previously in uh, shoe, indu shoe industries in Rwanda before 94. Unfortunately, most of those industries were either destroyed or the owners died or something yeah. happened to them. So they no longer existed. Maybe there were like a few, but they would never allow you to get in and see what was happening. Mm. But now I learned that our, our production facility today is open. Anybody can enter and just see what we're doing. Oh. I learned that the reason why they never allowed us to enter is because their technology was too old and they really didn't have enough to show. Interesting for you to say that. We would assume that they were not letting you in on their trade secret because they did not want you to imitate it. But you're saying yeah. it's because of the, the the structure, the infrastructure. Yeah, was well, it was as, probably not. They were not capable of producing, or something was not right. And I see it now because if, no matter how small Zuri is, we still have better technology. We still have better production. We still have mm. even the products on the market that is made in one when it comes to footwear was suit leading, so that's, that, that's what we discovered as we yeah. went along. Yeah, and you've, you're saying you've opened it up to anyone who's yeah. interested? Yeah, we do have, we receive uh, Rwandans visiting, we receive um, uh, uh, tourists, we, we, honestly, anyone who wants to learn from us, and also we do train a lot of people yeah. in our production facilities, so we're pretty much open to everyone. So how then did you move from talking to Francois de Caubla to setting yeah. up your own business. So the thing is... And did it start while you're still studying or did you wait until you graduated? <laughs> we were studying. So we're okay. in the second year of university. So we talked to him and he's like, no, I can't. girls, I can see what you're trying to do, but I can do it, we can do it, we cannot produce a shoe from scratch. We believed in what, cap, cap, in his capacity to actually do it, but he didn't believe he in it because he hasn't... Yeah. Uh, and we're just like, with our knowledge, to be able to you know, even surf internet and, and check what kind of raw materials we could use and also test it with just to by turning down some of the footwear, we can be able to work together. Yeah. So 
when he said no, we're like, okay, we come back with a better structure. We came back and we actually did a pitch to him. Imagine pitching to a cobbler, just telling him, you know what we want to do? We want to build a company that would employ people, meaning we're learning to make a shoe, one shoe today, but we want to make two thousands on a monthly basis in the next five years. And he's like, wow. uh, okay, let's try. That's, but that was like pitching to me. And at the time, we didn't even have money to actually pay him. So we would, my best friend bought the first pair. We went back to the market. When we were, at least by the time we succeeded to make one pair, made one pair, sold it to my best friend. She actually started the whole business, <laughs> credit to her. And then um, went so back to the market. So you sat with this guy, he mm -hmm. showed you the whole process. Yeah, went to the market, bought the materials that we actually thought we needed, and then we went back to him like, here, more materials, we're making more shoes now. We're making two more pairs now. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, oh, you girls are actually really serious. So at the time, he did not have a space to work from, so we would go find him at his home, actually, which oh. is in Gahanga, super, a little bit far away from him. He would either take a bus or hop on a motor after school, again. And he would be very, very kind of, I would say that he was very impressed by the determination that we had. Well, so he decided would be now, he realized we were serious. He decided now, since you come very far, let's meet halfway. So he would meet us on the main road, like on oh. the paved road. And on a motor, we share everything, all the information, and then we would go back. And then if we want to learn with him, then we'll go find him at his home. Then later on, he's like, you know what? I have a daughter. She also does, co she does she's a cobbler. Can we actually co bring her in and see whether she can work with us? Then he brought in his, his oh, daughter. So we're oh. also really do, learning what kind of machinery do we need. A few months later, we, uh, um, someone that we know in the industry was selling their machinery. They were just sewing machines, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And we were like, this is a huge opportunity. So we had to get a few dollars and um, be able to buy those uh, secondhand machines. And to be honest, it was super difficult because we didn't have any money. So we had to ask family and friends, where, how do we actually do it? Before that, we only had a machinery because at university, I started learning how to sew. And I had saved $60. It was around 60,000 francs at the time. And I bought a sewing machine. That was oh. the only machine that we started with. And later on, we bought those second machines. We rented a house. Like, it was like a home in a neighborhood in Gikondo. Mm. Then we told uh, Mose Francois, because he's like an older man, that now we are settled. We need to actually him to be coming at work on a monthly basis. And he's becoming an employee. So he was our first And he employee. was okay with that. Yeah, at the time. Oh. And we were able to pay him on a monthly basis. And it started like that. So Francois was your first employee? Yeah. Amazing. And he's actually retiring this year. So, He's still with you guys? Yeah. Oh my He's goodness, yeah. that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I uh, imagine he must have taught many other people. Oh since yeah, then. he did. Yeah. He's taken a little bit of a rest for because he's taught so many people. Mm -hmm. Um, who are now teaching other people. So his yeah. legacy goes way, way long. And, it's an incredible story. And then that, that's how we actually started Uzuri at, at the time. And that our first production was in that setting, in that house, with myself, Isolde, and Muzehe. Then and I started training other people. Amazing. And today, you just told me a few minutes back, you're starting a shop in uh, Village Market in Nairobi. How far have you spread your wings? Not enough, because <laughs> the dreams are so big. We haven't even scratched the surface, because even at the beginning, I mean, when you look at the industry, it's, it's not a non-existing industry. We don't even call it a footwear industry. We say we're in the creative industry, or uh, because our sector also touches the circular economy or circular fashion. We say we're in the circular economy. Mm. Uh, I, I didn't mention that, but one of the major challenges was to, fact, to do something different. And so we decided to recycle used car tires to create the outsoles. And just for the purpose of being part of the movement in Rwanda, that is to protect the environment. Yeah. It was really an inspiration from our government. It wasn't something like, oh, let's be revolutionary. It was really pure inspiration. Mm -hmm. And also be part of the problem solvers in general. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I think recently we're speaking to a potential investor. And they were like, oh, so you're in the circular economy. Like a few years ago, and I was like, what is that? What is that? Yeah, what does that mean? We're just recycling tires uh -huh. to a point where Rema has now kind of recognized Uzuri as a company that has introduced the Fora technology, which is the recovery, reducing, reusing, and recycling used car tires. And 
really, it was just us trying to do something and the recognition has really gone a little bit beyond our expectations. You didn't see it happening this soon, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you're with us on The Real Talk, coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel in Chiovu. And I love to say you should check out their new menu and visit the Atmosphere Restaurant. We have an interesting conversation today with Kevin Kajirumundu, who's the founder and CEO of K and Y. I'm sure Uzuri K and Y. And I have a feeling you know Uzuri K and Y, but then probably you just didn't know where it all started. And you've heard of these two friends who met in school. We'll be right back. This is The Real Talk on uh, RTV. Thank you so much for being part of the conversation, Kevin. You once said on LinkedIn that with Uzuri, you were rejected many times. If you don't mind, could you share with us details of at least one of those rejections? Mm -hmm. I, I, thank you for the question. I think one, to begin, let me just say that I'm also very grateful for everyone who has ever believed in me. It's not me or my co-founder who have been like, oh yeah, we've done it, we just, we're so great. There's so many people who have been, our, our sisters, our brothers, um, our friends, my best friend, for example. Like, there's so many people who have been in our lives from the beginning and they have made all of this happen. Our team members, our employees, like everyone really, they did a great job and they're still doing it. And also some of the, our investors, people who really backed us up from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But of course in the middle, when I was making that, that I was actually really, <laughs> I was a little bit emotional, but also happy at the same time. I remember exactly when I, because my, my stories are also day. very, very intentional. I don't share that much, but if I share, it's very intentional. And so um, it's just different events that happened in, the, in, in, in between um, our growth and our journey, um, where I remember one day we were exhibiting somewhere and someone came in, they said, Oh, so this is footwear. This is di what is different. We explained, and I remember mm -hmm. the first thing that people would tell you from the beginning. We would pitch our product like it's a Apple product. Like we would be very uh, passionate about it, and, uh, f sharing just how our shoes we wanted to look like. Because the beginning, the product we have today doesn't look like the one that we had in 2015, for example. Yeah. It's evolved. And so it has evolved, and mm -hmm. that's because we were we were able to actually pitch it and tell people and actually listen to criticism from, I don't know, random people, from our clients, from anybody who would listen. Because when you're beginning, you're actually telling different people because you don't know who exactly is going to support you through. Mm. So you show up and you talk or, and listen at the same time. So I remember this person, one person told me, hey, so can this really grow and buy a Ferrari? And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm just, I'm just like, the purpose here is really not to buy for everything, yeah, the jobs that we have created. I remember I had an interview before, and they were like, what have you achieved ever since you started this company? And mm -hmm. was, um, a, a local journalist actually asked me that. And I said, oh, we have been able to create impressive jobs. We have been able to change people's lives. Mm -hmm. Kids are going to school because of this. They have health insurance. Mm -hmm. Moms, I, I visited some of my employees, they have built houses yeah. where, where they come from. And I was just so proud. And I said, it's so proud. And I said, no, have you been able to buy a car or buy a house? And at the time, the I didn't have a car. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. I was just like, you didn't okay. have a car. For you, achievement was all this even today, so, transformation in other people's yeah, lives. Yeah, even today, being able to buy a car is not an achievement no, it at isn't. all. It's no, just a no, tool no. that I'm using so that I can be able to navigate all yeah. this work. And so... Not just even major events that in, in involved fundraising, that involved uh, doors that really were important to us, where people actually would see you as a young but also woman. I'm a, kind of a rebellious. Like I don't really agree when people say, "Oh, because you're a woman, you're you have limitations." I see it, but it's not necessarily my belief. And so I believe that I can do anything. I grew up with supportive brothers, really. Even today, my brother's like, oh, you beat me here, I beat you here. So we're always wow. like competing. And so I believe that I was capable from the beginning. But growing up, you would enter an office or something, and then you get a look, a certain look, a certain comment for yeah. being a woman. And, and being you, young. Yeah, for being young. And you're just trying to fight it. And it's not, you, it's not always 
doesn't come out always like respectful because people are like, oh, why are you being that? Why are you being this? And so mm. um, I, was, I, mean, I recall being in an office and I'm signing a contract and this important person is just, thick, just really work looking at how I'm looking and, and, and all that. And my co-founder mm. as well, um, comments were made and all that. And so it became a little bit of, oh, wow. And, and those can be really disgusting, yeah. irritating. It doesn't you, stop you, you, Yeah, you, you're approaching this from yeah. a very professional place, but then somebody makes comments that are quite to condescending. A point, yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. To a point where you're just like, this is not worth it. You, and then you're also rejected because, because of that. And, and, and it, it happened, I was like, I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. Because I always believed in myself as... A person, not necessarily as a woman, just Nobody as a person. Nobody cares. <laughs> exactly. Because my, I have a friend of mine. I, I, I hope it, this is not becoming too casual. But I have a friend of mine. Yeah. Together, we always say that there's no such a thing as a woman in business. You're a business person. You're doing business. That's you're the competing. Thing. Yeah. Because even when we we're speaking to investors today, today they don't really say, "Oh, you're a woman. Let's uh -huh. invest in you." No, no. You're they, a business they will person. They'll probably say that on the surface, and then they're like, "Where are your numbers?" How competitive are they? What can you achieve? And <laughs> they want to come in the, in the background and see what, what have you done so far? Mm. And they want to see physical evidence. And so there's no such and a thing. And they're judging you as a business person, not, not as, as a, a woman, woman in business. Exactly. Yeah. So the rejections, it really came in as a result of, I guess, society, um, whatever they consider to be a woman. And, and also as a result of so many other things, um, I wouldn't even say that it's just, oh, I'm, I'm a victim or whatever. I'm just no. saying that there are also things that I didn't know. For example, when we went into business, I, not, none of us had a degree in finance or business administration, so we had to learn so many things. We had to make so many mistakes. And so some of those rejections may come as a result of not knowing um, yeah. or not having experience, but then you go back and, and and you learn and you crash it. <laughs> it, it becomes a learning so, so It becomes uh, journey. a learning journey, a learning process, but also um, it, it becomes very difficult because then our companies matures a little bit longer than other startups in other countries mm -hmm. compared to, let's say, a, a startup, I would say a startup in Kenya. I have, I have friends, co-founders in Kenya who have started after me and the, the companies are doing, I would say they're fundraising better, they, they have achieved better milestones. Yes, we have achieved a little bit of sustainability than them, uh, more, a little bit more than them, but they have a little bit of faster growth compared to companies, um, uh, startups That will be starting up here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I love the story. I love the milestones. I love how much progress you've made since you started. There's a time when your face was plastered on a billboard, and this is... Something that not very many people in Africa will say, hey, I got there. Your face was on a billboard at the New York Times Square. What was that about? And how did it make oh, you feel? Oh, that time. I was so tired. <laughs> I was so tired. tired. When, when the picture was taken, tired when the billboard went up. That whole process. Mm -hmm. You know, I like when things are up there and people see it and just like, oh my God, that's incredible. Without and knowing what went on behind the scenes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, no, I'm grateful. Um, I have this thing where I celebrate things a little bit after because after you're done, you're just like, I'm so tired. I need to move forward to the next thing. But I'm really grateful for NASDAQ Entrepreneurship Center. Um, and I applied for NASDAQ. In, NASDAQ. I'm sure a lot of people know what NASDAQ is. Mm -hmm. I was part of it because of the program that is um, kind of supporting entrepreneurs across the globe. So they have a cohort of like 10 people every now and then um, that are going through um, different aspects of especially the SDGs. They really focus on each SDG every now and then. Mm -hmm. And because of my company is in circular economy and I've, we focus really on the 4R technology, our company was selected to be part of the circular, um, I would say the SDG, the climate action, uh, sustainable cities, we're a bunch of different companies that were in that. And I think I was the only company from circular fashion um, and the rest of the companies were either from um, sustainable agriculture or energy really across Asia, US, Europe uh, and, and Africa as well. Mm -hmm. And together we're going through a journey where we're working with um, I would say 
sophisticated, experienced, wonderful, uh, either founders across oh. the globe, either coaches, professional coaches, executives who are go giving us an, I would say, immeasurable amount of knowledge that we would were you, never were you replace. confined in a particular place? Was this yes. process done, yeah. process done yeah. online? Or, or you were in a place with yeah. a compass? And it actually helps wow. for, for us to be able to learn. It's, it's more like the envy, but that is intense. Because uh -huh. you, you have to come, up, to come up with a project at the end, you have to present it. And it's very, very strict because if you don't present the project that, or how you're going to um, implement, it, implement eh? a transformation within your business, huh. it's, more, it's more like that. How are you going to make sure that your business is different at the end of the program? And how can you demonstrate that? How long is the program? It's actually four months, three oh, to man. four months, mm -hmm. and it's intense. For me, it was intense. I think it was intense for every founder in the group. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to say just How many me. were you in total? Ten. Okay. Ten. Oh. Um, ten or twelve. Mm -hmm. I think I remember everyone. We're still kind of close. And we were, uh, either one of us was fundraising, or one of us was doing something. At the time, I was also doing a Stanford program called Seed Transformation Program, and that program is also one year. I was also doing... Oh and a program at INSEAD, executive education. So that's why I say I was so tired. These were three things going on <laughs> yeah. at the same time. And I was also preparing for fundraising and preparing can be intense. Um, so when all that happened, I was just like, okay, thank you so much. It, it looks great. <laughs> we are on the, on the stock exchange. So you were too tired to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, uh, I still remember the feeling. And mm. so, um, it was incredible because at yeah. the end, the lessons that I got from all the programs, really, the, the NASDAQ uh, um, Entrepreneurship Center, even the, the, the Stanford program, the INSEAD, the executive, the, all of them really made me today uh, who I am because I'm able to kind of say, hey, I actually know a little bit about finance. I, I know a little bit about business. I know about a little bit about um, a financial story, for example. Yeah, yeah. So. It was incredible. Amazing. How did you get to know about the NASDAQ program? I get to ask because there could good, be good a lot of entrepreneurs that just don't know about these things. And they sit there and see their compatriots moving on, yeah. but they have no way of finding out about you know these things. What? Yeah. Good point. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I was saying earlier. <gasps> People make you. You don't they make, make yourself. You. Someone referred me to the program. They said, Kevin, I think you would be a good fit here. Could you please apply? This, I had no affiliation with NASDAQ whatsoever. Mm. And just a potential investor who just sent me an email like, hey, I think you should be able to apply. Again, it comes from what? From, what, again, what I mentioned earlier, which is pitch, we pitched our products from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Some of the results that I'm seeing today, I think that I, we did like five, six years ago. Uh, or we showcase our product somewhere and someone would remember, you know what, I've seen that company somewhere and I remember it now. Let me just see whether they could be a good fit for this particular program. Mm -hmm. Actually, investors, um, entrepreneurship, I would say that un the entrepreneurship ecosystem is always looking for each other. The more you're looking, the way you're looking for them, they're also looking, also for, looking you. for you. But you have to put yourself out there. You have to share your story. It's the same as the Tommy Hilfiger um, Fashion Frontier Challenge. Same. Yeah. Someone yes, just said me. I was going to come to Tommy Hilfiger as well. Uh -huh. Yeah. Someone just said me like, hey, we think you would be a good fit. They don't know oh. you from the beginning. Oh. Th that's it. And they'll... So even for the Tommy Hilfiger, it's someone that you did not know well. Mm -mm. No. Now, wow. It's actually someone who is part of the Lioness of Africa, and they had written a story about Uzuri way before, not me. They wrote a story about um, Uzuri wow. without us, actually. Mm -hmm. And then later on, we catch up on LinkedIn, and then they're just like, hey, here's a link. Do you think? I think they sent me like on a Saturday, and the deadline was like on a Monday. I was like, you know what? This is a person that I respect. I'm not going to be selected, but I respect this person. So I'm not going to say to him that I didn't. Apply. apply. I'm just going to apply for the sake of, because mm. I feel like I'm too late and I don't understand that much. So I started reading the whole weekend, working, doing research, and then I did the application. But also, when you do the application, you have to be a little bit ready. Also, the yeah. background, like you have to have something in place. You can't just say, I'm going to apply because someone else applied. No. And the reason why they say you're good fit, because they have also seen the work they, that they, you have they've put They've observed in. you over time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's... 
just the way we're looking for them, the whole ecosystem is interconnected. You need to find a way to enter, you need to find your door, and they will just be pulling you in a little bit. You know, what I hear you say is, and it's something that I, I've said it on the show over and over, I had a boss who many years told me, whatever you get to do, whatever opportunity you land on, give it your best, because someone mm -hmm. is always watching. And Absolutely. so, yeah, and you as an entrepreneur, you've said it, you've been pitching from the beginning. And all the years that you've done this, added something onto your way of pitching. You, at every process, you are learning something, you were getting better. And indeed, somebody was watching yeah. your steps. I agree. Beautiful. What would you tell a, a, a Rwandan entrepreneur that is just starting? And they need a tip, they need an idea of what to do with themselves in order to make themselves known or their business. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, now it's much easier because storytelling is uh, at the peak because of how easy it is to share. There's so many platforms now. I would say it's easy to share the stories, but I'm just gonna go back to the roots, the basics. Go in the background and do the work because at the end of the day, you're not gonna share things that did not happen. Um, and if you're giving information out there, people are gonna come and check and if it's not right, then you may end up actually um, ruining you lose your, your credibility. reputation, lose credibility, yeah. and also um, hurting your business. So I would rather go back in the back. Even today, there are to days the where work. I take time. I'm just like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to go to work, 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 work. And mm. if it looks like it's ready, then we can be able to share it. Mm. So it's important for entrepreneurs to actually focus on the product or the service that they are offering to customers and be out there because... I think for us, the first marketing that has ever happened for us, the, the, the better way we were able to market our products was mouth to mouth because customers would talk to each other in the time of Facebook and back in 2014, 15. Yeah. It was really incredible because I, I remember one person here who's like in the industry shared a, a shoes, well, our shoes on their Facebook and it just went, people started saying, oh, so we're making shoes in Rwanda. In Rwanda yeah. It was something new. And at the time, we we're just covering a little bit of this and that. We're just not there yet. Yeah. And then it started like that. And so put yourself out there. Also, don't be scared. I would say that entrepreneurs should not be scared of criticism. People will build your product. Unfortunately, today, the standards are a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. So if you come in, you need to also be ready for what you're going to get. Um, at the time, we had no shoe company to look up to, and so we were just really, the whole Rwanda was our lab, laboratory to be able to, sh to share our work and get feedback and be able to go back and make a better shoe. But now, you also have opportunity to come to Uzuri and learn yeah. how to make a better shoe or somewhere else, other companies that are doing great things today. So learn, do fact, something, They're, they're better placed it. than you want. Yeah, mm. yeah. Because they have you to look up to. Learn, work hard build your product or service, and then share your story. Yeah. And how, how do you maintain your work-life balance? A question of whether you have any... I was going to say I have no exactly life. <laughs> you have any <laughs> strategies or practices that you follow to strike the balance? Oh, good question. You know what? I'm still so young, so my focus is today work, to be honest. And so I haven't had... And I, and I think that's the one, one of the investments that young people have. If you don't have a family yet, then you're lucky to be able to actually focus on work fully. You have no excuse. <laughs> um, and it's much, much easier when you do it that way. Um, you're young, you hope on a motto, you, you don't have... I, we, we actually joke about it today, myself and my co-founder. Um, you don't speak in your own. I was going to say in your own. I say it in your own. My viewers do. In February, I pray that you're not going to die. Like, in February, I pray that December or November around that time. That whole, like, rain will be, I, I mean, it will be raining over us for the whole of, of April, November, and, and December. Because December is the time people are buying gifts and all. Mm -hmm. And we were, the deliv we were the delivery of the company. So we would deliver shoes to the customers, to their homes, because we didn't have a store. Oh, and customers would be like, Oh, I don't like this. I don't like that. Can you change it? I'll and go back. Got to go back. Change. Come back. And so <laughs> today I tell my staff members, like, you don't have to do the same thing, but you work hard, a little bit hard. I did that so you don't have to do it, mm. but you work a little bit hard. And so the fact that you, you can actually do that, it's a blessing. Today, 
I mean, that's the biggest investment that young people can have, the strength, the, the idea that you're just non un unstoppable is very, very important. So invest that and make sure that you get the best, the best out of it. So I'm able to still do it on that level and focus on my work. And when it comes to um, family, I'm very close with my siblings. I love them very much. They're, my sister actually usually say, my siblings are my inspiration because we, actually going back to my background, we lost our parents in 1994, both of them same day, same hour. And so it, it became a little bit difficult growing up, but we inspired each other to be who we are today. When are you? We are six. We lost our older sister in 2018. Yeah. She, she, she became like, she was our amazing like protector. Mm. Yeah. And so my sister likes to say that, um, oh, my, when people ask her, who is your inspiration? I used to be superficial, like Oprah, <laughs> Beyonce, but not yeah. anymore. Mm -mm. <laughs> I love them dearly, but my, but your siblings my are siblings your are my inspiration. inspiration today. And I got that from my sister because of how close and we have grown to be. We have really learned to be together because after the genocide, we, we were scattered across the families. We were, um, we actually survived the genocide in, at Yusimba, who recently passed. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, everyone was everywhere. So we didn't really get to connect growing up. Some of us, two of us will be together one time and the next. We actually, we were so surprised when our sister passed in 2018. We were in the same room for the first time since 1994. All of us, but one of us was not, oh. uh, was no more. And so we were just, since, I think since then, we've been really fighting to be together. We've been fighting to love one another, be friends. Be there for each other. Be there for each other. And so um, today when people ask like how close, people are surprised how close we are, we're just like, oh, we worked for it. Okay. We had to fight so that we can yeah. be there. So. Um, my siblings, I stay there for them. They're there for me. They're my rock. And yeah, that's my work life balance. <laughs> and of course, yeah. amazing friends. Very interesting work yeah. life balance. <laughs> Glad you're with us on the real talk. You, at times, you'll have to go buy raw materials from outside. There are other times you'll be trying to sell us those very nicely made Uzuri shoes. And we'll tell you, no, they are too expensive. I wonder what keeps you motivated and what makes you wake up every day believing that my business is going to work and it's going to work from here. Rwanda is the base. Rwanda is where we're going to make it. First of all, I just want to say how grateful we are to be able to operate from Rwanda because uh, it's the environment is incredible if you want to test any theory any business that it could work then this is the best best to to do it from um talking to visit rwanda and all those investors who are coming in <laughs> um so what really keeps me motivated truly is the fact that i'm responsible now i remember being studying uzuri just out of passion and also being you know trying to be part of the problem solve as mentioned earlier and then all of a sudden we have employees. All of a sudden that's probably the only thing they have learned how to do because for one of the setbacks we had or the challenges we had was skilled labor. And skilled labor in Rwanda is not an easy thing because at the end you have to invest in people way more than another company. That's why, again, it becomes a little bit longer for companies like ours to mature because yeah. first you have to teach people how to make shoes. Yeah. Then you have to put them up to standard to be employees then it becomes way, way And longer. sometimes when they have just reached there, somebody else comes uh -huh. and snatches them uh -huh. away from your we company? We were very lucky, actually, people stayed with us. We are okay. very, very lucky. And ex exactly that's why we're responsible. Uh, uh, if you have 10, 15, and 20, and 15, and 80 people who actually depend on the business, your life completely changes because you are responsible for people's lives to exist on a daily basis. Their kids need to go to school. Their kids need to go to the hospital. You are the one who actually is responsible for their mutual de santé, for example, or any other private insurance. So now you have to wake up. Yeah. You have to wake up and be, be a functional human being in society and continue supporting people. I wish I could say that I'm motivated by a lot of money that we're making. 
maybe in the future. I, that really makes me excited sometimes as well because in the future we may make actually um, we may put our business out there and actually be able to gain something great out of it. But today is the work that people, shoemakers, everyone who's running our company, that they're putting in. Because sometimes I'm like, they know better now than I do. Uh, we have kind of reverse roles where they know much, much better and they're, they're running the business with or without me uh, to be able to, to continue because they understand it's yeah. critical to their existence today. Yeah. It's, it's their responsibility. And so that really wakes me up in the morning and I'm able to continue my day. And I remember someone asked us, people give us, like, are you full-time in your company? Yeah, we are. Yeah. full Since the beginning, we are full-time in our company. How big is your team? Currently, we have 85 employees. Uh, our management team is around 15 people. Oh, wow. Are there any charity activities that you're involved in? So one um, pure charity activity is the one where we're giving footwear to um, kids in primary schools. It's something that we've been doing since, I think, three years back. And we've been able to give around 350 pairs, and we want to really continue. Every year we do give a few pairs to kids. Um, but those shoes are actually produced by trainees. Trainees are people who are, um, Uzuri trainees are people who are <laughs> learning shoemaking and other soft skills mm -hmm. you know, from our and production they're there for your workshop. Yeah, so at the end of the, their program, they have a final project. And the final project is really come up with a footwear that is functional. The reason why we made sure that, that that product belongs to someone is because the first program we did, people would make their final product and the shoe is not wearable. Mm. So we told them, hey, think that the product you're making is going to it's be going worn to be by worn. someone. Yeah. So we cannot sell them because they're actually products coming out of their great hands. So what mm. we did, we even tried to tell them, hey, make a shoe that you can wear. They, they failed. But then when we said, hey, let's make a shoe that kids are going to go to school with, they made it they work. They made it. So it's kind of an interconnected program. Mm. Wow. This is The Real Talk. My name is Jackie Lumbas, and our guest is Kevin Kajirimundu, who's the, the CEO and founder of Uzuri K and Y. We'd love to thank our hosts, Mythos Boutique Hotel in Kiovu. When we return, we get to know Kevin's six cues. Time for six cues, my favorite part of the show. Kevin, what has been the greatest highlight of your career? Um, I think the greatest highlight of my car career is the fact that I've been able to work with my co-founder for the past 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I used to take it for granted. That's not easy. And I, recently someone told me, oh, I admire how you guys work together. And I remember one of the investors we have on board, they recently highlighted, we are really investing in you because you guys... You've stuck seem together. like a great, yeah. Like what is the great. secret? Uh, if you can just share honestly, that. Okay, honestly, I don't think we are. I think the secret is, remember the, the beginning where I shared that we had great conversations? Mm -hmm. I think it's the foundation. The foundation that we built from the beginning and also set it, kind of creating a vision that we both um, could see ourselves in. Yeah. None of us could see us differently. It was not individual. Yeah. yeah. I just want to make sure that people know that we actually don't do things the same way, similar ways. Mm -hmm. We used to make that mistake and think, oh, we're the same people. People think we're the same people. We're completely no, different people, actually. We complete each other. And at times, we have had to take different routes, but same vision, different approaches. And then at the end of the day, we still share the vision. Beautiful. Question number two, do you remember who bought your first pair of sandals? Yes. This <laughs> my, my high school best friend, uh, Senorita. Oh. <laughs> she, she's the, she launched the business. Yeah, she did. <laughs> yeah. How much did that pair go for? It was around 10,000 francs. And who made it? The it was three of you? 10. The three of us. Yes, yeah, of France, course. Francois, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Senorita. All of our hands <laughs> were on that shoe. And I think she still has like those shoes. At some point, she has really yeah. old shoes that she still wears. She's like, these are my favorite shoes. I can't put them anywhere. Yeah. And I know she can buy other brands, but she, but she still keeps and cherishes yeah. that. Yeah. And then what drives you to do the things that you do? And I know you mentioned it just a while ago, yeah. but you can repeat it. Just a little bit of what drives me is just the fact that we're able to make a difference in someone's life. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'll never forget this. Somebody said... It, it was a, a great business person. I can't remember who, but I think he's also a big-time Hollywood celebrity. And he said, anyone who goes out to start a business in order to have an impact, transform people's lives, do it. They're not doing it for themselves, but for other people. Those kind of business people 
end up being great business people. I hope so. so yeah, so I feel you there. And then what do you do during your free time? That's if you have some free time. I do. I, I actually do. <laughs> um, I, 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 I love sports. Mm -hmm. I play, well, I do cycling. I play boxing. I play tennis. <laughs> <laughs> I go to the gym. <laughs> cycling, wow. boxing. Yeah, tennis. How many cages I also are swim. <laughs> You swim? Yeah. So I love Very sports sporty, so much. Yeah? yeah, I also I love sports. It's, mm. It really keeps me sane. And of course, of course, one important part is just the my girlfriends, my friends who are around me, sp spending time with them. Even when we spend like six months, like SOS, we haven't, you know, <laughs> We've sat down. down. Yeah. yeah. I remember someone say that it, it, it is as um, deadly, I mean, it's as deadly as something, I think they reference some sort of disease or something as not have girlf not having girlfriends. Mm. So, so you you, you get are, to do you things with guys, yeah. yeah. And then, what one word do you feel describes you best? I would say um, courageous. Fantastic. At least I think my friends would say my family and friends would say courageous. I yes. hope they would. <laughs> it's one of the most important C's. <laughs> they say that courageous, confident. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And then what is the worst day in your life? Worst day in my life? Uh, I have a lot of those. <laughs> um, I think if, if, I think part of it is, um, I wouldn't even say worst day, it's just setbacks, like when you get rejected once in a while and whatnot. But mm. I think losing a loved one is, is one of the, the hardest and, and the worst yeah. days that you never forget. Yeah. I didn't know that until it happened to mm. me. So yeah, mm. I get it. It's part of being an adult, actually, because for me, even if we have, we lost a lot of people in 1994, I was a child, so I don't remember none of it. And those people were never today, part of my life. Yeah. Those people were never part of it. So I didn't experience true loss until I was a little bit older. And uh, it's uh, something that is part of uh, you being uh, an adult. An adult. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Quite interesting. Kevin, thank you. It's been such a pleasure sitting down with you. Thank you for listening to me. Oh, goodness. And I would love us to do this again. <laughs> I hope you will come the next time I call. I will. I will. Thank you. Would you wish you all the best with what you're working on, uh, setting up your new branch in Nairobi? Yeah. And we look forward to having you back here to tell us whatever else you will be doing. I'm looking forward to seeing, yeah, to seeing what you achieve with the show. I'm yeah. really happy for you guys. Thank you so much. And that is our guest, Kevin Kajiramundu, who is the CEO and founder of Uzuri KNY. You will find them at different locations around Kigali. I could begin to mention them for you, but no, we will find that on social media. Use the hashtag The Real Talk in case you've got a question that you want Kevin to respond to. She will be online, she will respond to it, and so will I. This is The Real Talk coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel in Kiovu. Whenever you find time, please come and try out their new menu. I think I've been talking about that. You must be thinking I'm a glutton. No, I'm not a glutton. I just love good food. It's been a pleasure. We do hope to see you again next week. God bless you.